This is our annual meeting for 2022. It is also our leadership conference of the year and our quarterly plant managers meeting. So we've got a lot going on. We also have a products of industry expo where we are trying to showcase all the products that industry makes and make the connection with people between the industrial plants that they might see on the river and the end products that they make such as shampoo or hand lotion or car seats or tennis shoes. So a lot of those are on display today. Our message for today is great leaders leading great communities. Industry feels like we are the community. We are in the communities. We are good partners and neighbors with the neighborhoods all around. Uh, the folks are engineers and scientists and craftspeople. And we, want, we are partners with the community. So our mission is to bring value to our communities by developing innovative solutions advocated with one voice. Industry provides really great jobs. They pay excellent. And they're great partners. The people who work in industry volunteer to lead your Cub Scout uh, den or the local t-ball team. And they're out there, they're in your churches, they're, ev they're everywhere, they're around us. And so they, we are the bedrock of the community and we want people to understand that. So when they drive by a facility, it's not just a towers and, and steam, it's, it's people. We're, we're really people, we're part of the community. My purpose in being here was to talk to the group about uh, what's going on in the economy, to talk about the national economy. Was it gonna grow, not grow, uh, grow slower, what it's gonna do? Some of the threats out there. Then I was to talk to them about the price of oil and price of natural gas, very important to this particular group because they use oil and natural gas as an input in their production processes. And then I wanted to talk to them a little bit about climate change. The main message for today was that A, the national economy is going to be growing slower, I think, uh, after growing very, very rapidly last year as we were coming out of the shutdown, that it'll grow much slower the next two years. Um, part of that's due to the fact we're not getting the stimulus checks. Part of it's due to the fact that we're raising taxes and increasing regulations. And both of those are, have a tendency to stymie the economy. I, taught, I wanted to get across to them what I think is going to happen to the price of oil. There's a lot of discussion out there right now about the price of oil going to $100 a barrel. I don't think that's going to happen, certainly not for a long time. It may, be, it may happen for a day or so, but not for a long time. Talk to them about the price of natural gas. The price of natural gas is vitally important to them, uh, which is very low here compared to Europe and compared to Asia, which means that they are set up here perfectly to pick up more and more share of the global chemical market because their, their, their prices are going to end up being a lot cheaper than Japanese chemical firms and European chemical firms. And then the last thing I talked to them about was the climate change and some of the data that I look at support all the uh, calamity that might happen if we don't do something immediately, do some really radical changes in our lifestyle. The last time we did an economic impact study of the chemical industry, it was considerably smaller than it is today. And at that time, there are about 270 jobs for Louisianans that can be traced back to the existence of the chemical industry. That is a huge number. That's out of about two million, about uh, an eighth of them, about every eighth job uh, in, this, in this state can be traced back to the chemical industry. Today, Gabria had our annual meeting where we were focusing on great leaders make great communities. We heard a lot of good discussion around economics, economics for oil, gas, the chemical industry, and what potentially is in store for 2022. We learned a lot about the workforce of the future. How do we engage new people? What kind of new tools and talents are out there? As well as what does it really mean to be a great leader in our community? It's not a enough just to lead your manufacturing facility or be a good steward of industry, it's also expected that you give back to the community both in your time and your talents to make the communities in which we live, we work, and we raise our families the best communities we can. As leaders, you have to step up to lead, and then we have so many leaders in industry who are making positive impacts in the communities every day. So it's really to rally those potential leaders to step up and make a difference. So whether you're fighting for a new Mississippi River Bridge, whether you're looking to go ahead and help improve the lives of people through the United Way, or whether you're looking at bringing that new expansion project to create great new jobs to produce products that help fight against COVID, uh, help build homes, 
help create the next solar panels or next uh, electric vehicles. It all starts with our industry and it all starts with our chemistry and the cooperation between our chemical manufacturers and the contractors, right, who supply a lot of the people to build, maintain and operate is the strongest partnership as ever. It's hugely important for, for the economy of Louisiana. If you think about the oil, gas and chemical industry next to agriculture, it's the chief industry that we have. As you saw probably from Dr. Lauren Scott, over 280,000 direct and indirect jobs. So when you think about the state, and the number of people that directly or indirectly make a living, 280,000, if you think about the families and the income, but also importantly, the tax base that everybody pays to go improve the school system, to go ahead and pay for the support uh, the communities need and look forward, we are, a, we are next to agriculture, the chief economic engine in the state, and people depend upon us. Oh, I'm excited. It, it's always invigorating to be amongst colleagues and friends. Uh, take a chance to reflect on what did we accomplish in 2021. We accomplished a lot, and the challenges that we're facing in 2022, but looking forward that we actually have a plan, and we're going to ensure that we bring value to our communities. We're focusing on how do we ensure a safe workplace, how do we provide the workforce for the future, so it's it's an invigorating event. With Gabriel, we're getting together. Uh, this when all the industry gets a chance to come together, uh, share ideas, uh, listen to uh, some uh, really good speaker and panelists uh, that give us their views on industry. With the recent climate, uh, environmental comes up a lot, and industry really does uh, a great deal to ensure that we're taking care of our environment. And uh, we make uh, all the products that make the world go. And uh, we want to make them here in uh, Louisiana and the United States. Uh, and that's what we're proud of. It's very important because the industry uh, helps uh, in charitable ways. It helps uh, give our community uh, very good jobs. It helps uh, uh, the contractors uh, who also, uh, you know, the money is distributed throughout the uh, community. So. Uh, it's very important to really on, on many levels in all aspects of, uh, of the community. Um, my reaction to today's event is uh, it's a very good turnout and it's good to see uh, everybody in the industry coming together uh, and working together uh, you know, as one. The industry is part of the community. We are the community, we live, we work here, we play here, our kids go to school here, and also we have an industry showcase going on to kind of highlight some of the products that we make and how they're used in the community you'll find that it'd be impossible to live your life without products that we make here in South Louisiana. For example, at my plant, my small average size plant down in St. Gabriel, we, we uh, make molecules that are used to purify drinking water for New York City, Washington DC, Los Angeles, Chicago. Um, all that's down here in South Louisiana. Chemical industry, the petrochemical industry represents 25% of the state's economy. Um, you know, that includes all the people that work for us and with us, as well as the, the ones here. Um, so 25% of the state's economy is quite significant. It's great to finally reconnect in person with a lot of the people. It's been great to highlight all the good things that we do, um, the uh, economic impact that we have, as well as the personal impact, you know, to see friends and family again, and it's been fantastic. This year, our board of directors wanted to include more staff members from our sites and contractors in order to raise the awareness around the issues that industry as a whole in our region are facing. Industry has come under fire more and more in recent years and is being challenged to show its value to the public like never before. The more people in our organizations that are aware of the issues and can speak to them armed with knowledge, the further the facts are gonna go. We need all of you to act as leaders and help spread the word about the value of industry with your friends, families, and neighbors, and even with your children's teachers and coaches when the opportunity arises. Many of you have already heard of the interorganizational communications campaign called Industry Makes, and today we'll be talking about it some more. The theme of today's meeting is Industry Makes Great Leaders Leading Great Communities. We now have the tools to arm our employees and friends of all kinds with the information needed to communicate that where industry locates, communities flourish. The reason for the theme today and our topic is that it's leadership that makes the difference between sitting back and living with a situation or a problem that isn't ideal. So leaders step up and take action 
And I'm proud to say that Gabria, with our excellent board of directors, members and partners, who all lend their voices, some huge improvements have been made in workforce development, safety, and now public relations. Although we do discuss a lot, the topics are all things where companies who might compete can come together to improve industry for the whole. We're so pleased to be working for all of you, our members and our community, to bring value to our communities by de developing innovative solutions to common industry issues advocated with one voice. Did you notice it? Probably not, but that's our new mission. Our board just approved a revision and you'll hear more about why later in the program. But at this time, I'd like to call your attention to the beautiful flower centerpieces. So there is one colored sticky note under a chair at each table. If, uh, so if y'all would check that when you get a chance. If you have that sticky note under your seat, then you are the winner of this centerpiece. Please, please take them home and surprise somebody special. <laughs> Thank you, Connie, good morning, yeah, no jokes. Um, but I would like to go ahead and thank you all for being here. This is such a long time coming, right? I think all of us personally, professionally, our lives have been on hold in so many different ways for such a long period of time. Just getting back, back to basics, back to the things that uh, continue to make our industry great, back to being able to network, communicate, talk, and dialogue is, is, is just a fantastic opportunity. When you think about today's program, one of the shifts that we've also pivoted to is leadership, right? As an industry, right? As the manufacturing industry in our, in our region, it, it is a lot more, right? It's what we make, what industry makes. From every vehicle that brought you here, whether it's electric or gas powered, whether it is the clothes you're wearing, whether it's the home renovations you did or were forced to do after the, uh, the devastation from Ida, all of these components are supplied by our industry. And it's something that we're all very, very proud of and have to consistently remind people. And as we even move towards a new realm of power generation, electrification in our communities, et cetera, our industry, right, the men and women in this room are gonna lead the way in terms of taking us to these new horizons. And as we explore options for carbon capture, sequestering, the greening of our world, it's also our industry that's going to be developing, implementing, and executing the solutions to take us there. So all of these things are things that we should be very, very proud about, and our leadership as an industry and the community and in our industry is actually what's gonna take, uh, take us this way. So I hope you guys all very much enjoy the program. And today, part of dialogue, right, is community. So if we do have any people from the general community, whether it's government officials, elected officials, public officials, any officials, right, that are here that are not us, if you can, just put your hand up and let's go ahead and recognize you. Education goes a long way. Education and dialogue and discussing about what we do is certainly important. Uh, we are, as industry, certainly a ready and willing partner with our communities, and we're always willing to listen and to work together to bring value, solve common problems with issues in our community for the common good of our companies, our employees, and of course, our neighbors. And that's, as Connie has stated, that's where we pivot a little bit on our mission. Because as we've reflected over the last number of years, we add a whole lot more than simply manufacturing and great jobs in our community. We have leaders embedded in every portion of our society and our community driving solutions to these common problems that we face. And although the COVID-19 is not over and it's moved into now an endemic and it's hit us deeply, we do want to go ahead and make sure that we continue to be safe and we continue to keep our community safe. So with that, just some brief words, and thank you again for being here. I'm so excited to see everybody's happy, shiny face. So we selected these three panelists based on some recent experiences that they've had in some projects at their sites, where they utilize some of the latest in skills and technology, and we're hoping that they wouldn't mind sharing some observations with us as we all look at ways that we can modernize our workforce development programs so I think the first thing I wanted us to do, though, is um, understanding that we have some community members in the audience. I think it'd be a good opportunity to go down the line 
and for each of you to give us a basic overview of your site, your plants, what's being produced there, and uh, any other introductory remarks that I might have missed when I first introduced you. So, Paul, you want to start with you? Paul Hardevant. I'm at Formosa Plastics. I'm over the vinyls division within Formosa Plastics. There we go. And uh, uh, so I have responsibilities here in Baton Rouge and in Texas, at our Texas site. Um, we produce PVC. So uh, we take our, our first product is EVC, ethylene dichloride, convert it to vinyl chloride. And then that makes our final product, which is PVC. It's a powder. And it ultimately it's shipped out to customers to make pipe uh, a realm of, of plastic uses. So uh, we have about 400 employees at the site, a um, mixture of resident contractors and, um, and for most of employees themselves. So we've been here a long time. It's, a, it's an old site kind of tucked behind Exxon uh, on the river. But uh, we've been a, a member in the community for a long time and, and we try to be as active as we can. Hello everyone, I'm Darylene Harris. I uh, work for Shell Catalyst and Technologies, which is one of the divisions of Shell um, that actually manufactures uh, refining catalysts. So at my plant in Port Allen, we're responsible for producing powder and uh, refining catalysts for hydro treating that may be at many of your plants. Um, because it is a global business, we are one of six plants that Shell has that makes catalysts, and we are the largest. Um, as you guys know, we also have Shell is represented with our geyser plant also, and our narco plant. And we are recently announced plans to uh, revitalize convent into a biofuels and uh, you know, advance higher ethylene, uh, higher uh, olefins plant also. So a lot of work going on, but that's what And lastly, I'm Jerry Liebold. And I'm, I have the pleasure of being the senior vice president and general manager. And for those that know me, I like to call myself the head coach for our facility down in Geisman. We've been there for 60 years. We're on about 2,000 acres, about 2,000 team members. Um, integrated chemical manufacturing. So we like to say you basically touch every day things that we make. Right, we go into that. We love when the old tagline for BSF was, you know, we don't make the things you make, but you use, we just make it better. I like that old stuff, right? And for those of you that remember the old VHS tapes that had BSF on them, does anybody remember those? Mm -hmm. I have one, yeah, okay, that's, I'm the OG, the old guy, like they seem to say, so there's, there's a few of those. <laughs> but we, we make products that go into things like wipes for antiviral wipes, disinfectants, things that go into your laundry detergent. Might go into the cushion in the shoes you wear, or the cushion in the seat that you're in. Could be on the deodorant, the cosmetics that you use. Basically, you can't get out of bed in the morning without touching the products that our stuff goes into. And that really is like your mattress. You start with that, but also in your soaps and perfume, you name it. So we're proud of that. We're the world's largest chemical company, and our site is the largest in North America. So there's six large German term for boons. But that just means we start with a molecule, maybe it's natural gas, and try to use it all the way through the process, eliminate all waste, and make products that you use every day better. This first question is actually going to be for Jerry. So in the past, we've had project supervisors that we've seen walking around in the field with a clipboard, pen, and paper. And today, we're seeing those same supervisory positions walking around with a computer tablet. So having to learn how to operate one of those is an example of a, a skill of the future, right? So, Jerry, you guys have recently completed a project, correct? And um, can you tell us of any skills like that that were used during this project um, that revealed workers using newer, modern tools or technology that we haven't really seen so much traditionally? Yeah, like I said, you know, I may be older school, so I still have my old clipboards. I've got those. I even have a slide wall in my office. But anyway, the, it's very interesting. Many of you may have newer plants or be privy to work in newer plants. Well, ours has been here for 60 years, so we had to start with kind of a, you know, how do we get to the new age? How do we make use of things that are enabled with computers, the new technology, with tablets, drones, you name it. So it really started with infrastructure, and we didn't complete the project. I'd say we're right in the middle of it. It started with things like drones, being able to do inspections of pipelines, towers, flares, you name it. And every year, really even faster than that, there are new technologies that come out that are enabling us to use drones for more things like inspections and confined space. These tablets, I think, were really a great enabler for us. 
from electronic permitting, really streamlining that process. You can grab the tablet, write and go in and do your permitting. You can go out and do your field checks, making sure everything is locked out, it's safe, the job is ready to go. You know, it really eliminates the paper which somebody might grab. It might be a year old and not up to date. So those tablets were fantastic because it's real time, up to date um, procedures, permits, checklists. Even on our tablets, you can go out in the field and you can scan a barcode and a mechanic can say, okay, step one, here's what I do. Can have pictures. Uh, I think it's revolutionary and I think we have later, we'll probably get into some questions on some other enablers. But again, I think we're, we're, we're not in the forefront. I think maybe, to be honest, we're a little slow. We're kind of big as a company. We get to be a little slow. Many of you might actually be able to share a little later on, on some of your advancements in that uh, where we're leading. But it's a bit exciting, and I will say it just changes every day. So without further ado, Dr. Scott, please come to the stage and help us understand what 2022 has in store for us. I looked at this picture, and I know you're saying, who is this imposter? <laughs> But I am also in marketing, so I'll probably tell you that. I actually just had a, let's see if this, this baby working. I just had a very uh, important, uh, interesting birthday uh, about a week ago. And as I thought about that, I thought about going to my high school reunion recently. And uh, I went, you know, came up to the hotel, and I went in the ballroom. I looked at the ballroom, who are all these old people in this bar? Said, what is this all about? So finally, I walk inside. And, I see this guy and I say, who is this, what's, what's this group of people here? This is a Permian High School class of 1960. I said, what? Well, that's my class. He said, no kidding. What did you teach? The other thing I do, I, I, since you mentioned Jesus Christ, it turns out I do teach uh, a lot of Bible classes. It turns out right now I'm teaching Ecclesiastes. If you know anything about Ecclesiastes, it's one of the books of wisdom in the Bible, James in the New Testament, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and the others. So I'm going to be sharing you, share with you some, some important pieces of wisdom as we go along. For example, this, this marriage wisdom here that we got from Sam Elliott. Uh, marry a short gal and keep your guns on the top shelf. She'll still might get you, but you'll hear her dragging the chair across the floor. I believe, so I think that was, that was a good one. Well, I have a lot of things I'd like to share with you today. I want to talk, uh, first of all, about what's going on in the national economy unusual things that are happening out there. A couple of you have heard me talk about this a little bit before, a little bit of repetition here maybe with some things we've done before. I want to start by looking at this picture, which is for some reason screwed up on this particular chart. Uh, but this is the picture of what has happened to real gross domestic product uh, uh, so far uh, from the beginning of the pandemic until now. And I want to point out this, uh, I, I can't tell you why on this particular computer this is screwed up, so bear with me here. But if you look at that first, the second quarter of 2020, uh, look at that decline in real gross domestic product. Uh, 30, almost 32% decline in real gross domestic product. If you look at the Bureau of Economic Analysis, which collects these data, it has been for about 73, 74 years. This is the worst decline that the economy's ever been through in that 73 years of gathering quarterly data. The, the, matter of fact, the second worst was in the latter part of the 1950s when real gross domestic product fell about 10%. This is three, over three times worse than the worst quarter we had ever been through. And so, and, and the interesting thing about it is this, this decline was not because there was some imbalance in the economy. There were, you know, there was a housing a, a boom bust or a tech uh, bust or something like that. It's strictly due to the federal government saying, we're going to shut this place down. Now, uh, when you look at the way we've come out of it, we've come out of it really strongly. There's been some uh, really strong growth as we've come out of this. Typically, when we see numbers like uh, uh, anything around 3.5%, we say, hey, man, that's really great growth. But we've had numbers in the sixes and the four and halves and things like much higher growth rate than 3.5%. Well, what the heck is going on here? Well, part of it is the fact that we went down so that'd go far. So we have a lot to come up. We were just popping up, and it wasn't again because of any imbalance. It's strictly because we're shut down. So you unshut down, if that makes any sense, you're going to start to come back fairly rapidly. But there's something else that was happening during this time period. And that is, if you think about, you remember Connie from the Principles of Economics class, real gross domestic product, think of this big pie that represents real gross domestic product. It represents all the spending that takes place in the economy. The biggest part of that pie, two-thirds of that pie, 
is personal consumption spending. When you people go out and buy a restaurant meal, a car, theater ticket, etc., clothes, that's the biggest part of the pie. Now, one of the things you'll notice here, this is what has happened to personal income in the United States. Notice it was just kind of growing along, growing along, growing along, growing along, and then suddenly, boom! Look at those huge spikes that occurred there in personal income. And of course that was because of the stimulus checks that people received. Huge amounts of money pumped into people's pockets. Plus, the extra $300 they got for, uh, uh, for, for unemployment insurance, which I'm told had absolutely nothing to do with the fact that people didn't want to come back to work. <laughs> There's something economics wrong about that. But anyway, anyway, by the way, little side note. Can I take a little side note here? Show this picture at Business Reports uh, Top 100 lunch. Many of you were there, I'm sure. Hillary Moore was in the room, our DA here. He said, if you look at that chart right there, that's exactly what uh, 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 opioid overdoses look like. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? Exactly like. He should be a picture of it. It's a mirror image of that. By the way, it's also a mirror image of what happened to casino revenues. But anyway, remember that the two-thirds of real gross domestic product is, uh, is personal consumption spending. Well, look what happened to personal consumption spending. After it's just kind of moving along here, it's not doing very, very much, boom, it goes way, way down. I'm not going to try not to put your eye out here. <laughs> look what happened to personal consumption spending. Also. This shot straight to the ceiling. Now, think about this for just a minute. That caused that two-thirds part of the pie to grow like crazy, right? So if it caused it to grow like crazy, and we're not going to have those stimulus checks coming forward, mm -hmm. what do you think is going to happen to real gross domestic product <coughs> this year? Okay, that two-thirds part of the pie is not going to be growing like it has in the past. Kind of keep that in the back of your head. The other thing is they were spending like crazy, which means they were drawing down inventories in retail stores like crazy. Matter of fact, they were overdoing it because they were stocking up. I mean, you still have a garage full of toilet paper, okay? <laughs> stocking up like crazy, and then on top of that, you have a supply chain problem. What do you think's been happening in inventories? Inventories have been depleted all over the place. Matter of fact, inventories in retail stores have reached, if you kind of look at the, the, the inventory to sales ratio, it is the lowest it's ever been since they've been collecting data from this in retail stores. And it's just going right straight through the floor, uh, which is going to cr create another interesting little thing we'll see here in just a minute. Now, as a matter of fact, just to show you how much people have spent, look at this chart on, on retail spending. Retail spending, here is the beginning, uh, here is the very start of the Great Recession, okay? But for the Great, to grow by 21.4% retail sales, it took them uh, about eight, nine years to grow by 21.4%. Uh, Retail sales grow by 21.4% in about 11 months. Okay, because of all that money that people had being pumped into their pockets. And we got these really big numbers in real gross domestic product. Uh, and uh, now, you can't see where that little circle's supposed to be in that little circle. <laughs> it's supposed to be, be, bear with me, it's supposed to be on the fourth quarter, that 6.9%. 6 we just got this great number of 6.9% growth in the fourth quarter, and everybody's like, ha, ah, dang, this is really growth. This is really growth. Until you look at the parts of the pie. You got personal consumption spending, that's the biggest part. You got business spending, when you people go out and buy machine equipment, and stuff like that in your farm, build a plant. And then you have the hated government spending. You got one that's kind of, can you imagine a negative piece of pie? That's, that's net foreign spending. Then there's another little baby piece there called the change in business inventories. Normally it's a teeny tiny tiny part. Let me show you something. This is the, the, the picture of the contributions to real gross domestic product. The dark part of the purple line. The purple line is a whole change in real gross domestic product. The dark part is the part that's due to the change in business inventories. Okay? And, and normally, as you can see by looking at this, the, 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 the dark part is tiny, tiny, tiny until you get to this quarter. Of this 6.9%, 4.9% was due to build people building up inventories. Okay? It wasn't due to the thing that really caused the economy to grow. Your business investment spending, your, your, your personal consumption spending, your government spending. It was due to the people building, rebuilding their inventories up. If you took out that influence, real gross domestic product would have grown by 2%. 
two percent, <coughs> which is not which which is in keeping with what I think is going to happen going forward. You're going to have a much slower growth of gross domestic product because the other stuff is just not going to be growing. You're not going to have those big spikes that cause personal consumption spending to grow. You're, this is this. I really think things are starting. It's going to start to slow down. Now, uh, I, I, again, if you look at the forecast, this is crazy. But anyway, if you look at the forecast going forward, I got two forecasts for you here. One from the Wells Fargo Group. One from Consensus Forecast USA. The dark numbers are the numbers going forward. And, uh, and you can see in, in the in the 2022, the year we're in right now, there's some pretty good growth numbers in there. I mean, those growth, again, remember, 3.5% is pretty good. But they're talking about numbers in excess of 3.5%, or at least 3.5% more. Now, I don't think that's going to happen. I've already told you one reason I think it's not going to happen, because we don't have those spikes. We're going to, to, we're going to come way down from those spikes in personal consumption spending. It is not going to keep up with what it was before. But there's a couple of other things that are going on that I think would cause, uh, cause the economy to slow down, and that is higher taxes. Uh, for example, uh, you can't read this, but if you could read this, this is the corporate income tax rate in the different countries in the industrialized world. Now, right now, we're at that black line. We're kind of right in the middle. Uh, the, 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 the House Democrats want to raise that corporate income tax rate to the red line. But we would be the third highest corporate income tax rate in the industrialized world. Now, you've had a principles of economics class, right? What does that motivate corporations to do? Motivates corporations to find someplace else to be, right? Uh, and now, by the way, again, what you learn in your principles of economics class, the general public does not understand this. Corporations do not pay taxes. Corporations are an accounting fiction, okay? The people that pay taxes are the stockholders. Pay taxes. And you think, well, they deserve it. Have you looked at your uh, pension plan lately? Guess, guess, who, guess who's generating the money for your pension plan? Have you looked at your insurance policy lately? How can your insurance people take this much money from you and pay your heirs this much at the end? Okay, because they take your money and they invest it, guess where? Exxon Mobil, BASF, uh, Shintech, they, they invested in the, in the stock market. Okay? You are, most people are stockholders without even realizing they're stockholders. Second group that pays for it is the workers within those corporations because the corporation ends up having to pay out more taxes and can end up paying at least no more in wage rates. And then, of course, if you took your principles of economics course, you, took, you, you studied something called the tax elasticity of demand. And that is, you know that part of those taxes are going to be passed on to the consumer. You know, how much is going to be passed on depends more on that demand curve is flat or that demand curve is vertical or almost vertical. Depends on the elasticity of demand. But these are the people who are going to be paying taxes. Now, the other nice thing to remember about this is just because you raise the tax rate, corporate tax rate, to the third highest industrialized world, does not mean you're going to bring in more money. Okay, you remember when... Uh, Back in the old days, you, you studied something called the Laffer Curve. The Laffer Curve says, you know, it kind of looks like this. You can start raising tax rates and you start bringing in more money, but there's a point at which if you raise more tax rates, you know, in this case, you cause corporations to leave, okay, or do a whole lot less, and so you actually bring in less money. As a matter of fact, there's these two groups. One is the Penn Wharton Group, which is a very kind of to the left group, who they say if this tax rate is passed, that it will actually lower revenues by, uh, what does that say, $33 billion. Another group, which is a little bit more to center, maybe to the right of center, the Tax Foundation says it will actually lower revenues by about, what is that, $24 million, $24 billion, I'm sorry. Okay, this, there, there's, no, there's almost no question that rates like this will cause revenues, total tax collections, to go down. But I mean, the president is surrounded by people who I think irrationally hate corporations. They just, they just hate corporations. They think they're a problem, they keep taking from, they're taking from people, and they're keeping it, it's all going to wealthy people, not to stockholders. They don't want to understand who stockholders are. And so they, they, so, so this, this, they kind of get away with this stuff. Now, by the way, uh, other tax increases, there's been a proposal to raise the top marginal tax rate from 37% to, to almost 40%. This is under the Bill Back America. Thank goodness that didn't pass. Because if you look at this, this, again, is an industrialized world. This is what the personal tax rate is when you include 
federal and, and state in there. Right now, where the, where the black line is, we're below it. We would actually have the highest personal tax rates in the industrialized world. Okay, if this, if this was passed. Now, one thing that did pass, which really impacts everybody in this room, was in order to finance the infrastructure bill, was they reinstated the Superfund tax, which is a tax on volume produced of chemicals, okay, and oil and uh, gasoline, that sort of thing that's produced out there. And, uh, you know, we are the number uh, six state in the nation in terms of our uh, chemical production. It's a relatively small state, relatively small population, number six. And uh, there are about, as I say, about 270,000 jobs in our state that are either directly or indirectly tied to your industry. Okay? And you're getting, a, you're getting a tax levied on you that's a per unit tax. It's not a percent of value tax. It's a per unit tax. And what that means is you can be losing your own. You can be losing money. Okay? You can be losing money. You still have to pay the stupid tax. Okay? So, uh, you may think, this is, this is okay. This is good. This is righteous. This is fair. Very important word. This is fair. But I need to remind you what you learned in your principles of economics class. When you raise taxes, you shift the cost curves of firms upward. You shift the cost curves of firms upward. They produce less output and higher fewer people. Higher fewer people. Less growth and real growth in domestic product. Now, the other thing I think is that is a problem. Oh, by the way, great tax quotes. This one from Ronald Reagan. The taxpayer, that's somebody who works for the federal government and does not have to take the civil service examination. <laughs> oh, this other great uh, uh, economist, Jay Leno, <coughs> worried about an IRS audit, uh, avoid what is called the red flag. Okay? That's something the IRS is always looking for. Uh, <coughs> for example, uh, you have some money left in your bank account after paying your taxes. That's a red flag, and you need to be, you need to be careful about that. Now, the other thing I think is going to slow our economy down going forward is more regulation. Uh, this is a picture of the number of pages in the Federal Registry uh, since 1960. And what you'll notice here, let's see if this will pop up properly. This is where, this is where Biden cut his teeth as the Vice President. What you'll find is that six of the ten highest years of additions to the Federal Registry <coughs> occurred during the Obama Biden administration. As a matter of fact, the highest year ever was in the last year of the Biden Obama administration. And this, this is where he cut his teeth. This is kind of the way he thinks about this. Uh, as a matter of fact, I don't know if you realize this. Uh, some of you may have been in other talks where I mentioned this. But there was a presidential memo that was put out. Uh, uh, the very first day that Biden was in office, here's what that presidential memo says. First of all, when Congress passes a piece of legislation, that legislation then goes to the Office of Management Budget, and in the Office of Management Budget, uh, they, they are supposed to, it first of all goes to, to, the, to the executive branch, they come up with the rules and regulations for implementing the law. In the Office of Management Budget, it's supposed to do a cost-benefit analysis of, uh, of the law. It's, if the benefits exceed the cost, okay, but if they don't, then you need to go back and re rethink this thing out. This is the sentence that was in that memo. Ensure that the review process promotes policies that reflect new developments in scientific and economic understanding. Look at this next phrase. Fully accounts for the regulatory benefits that are difficult or impossible to quantify and does not have harmful anti-regulatory or deregulatory effects. In other words, throw out all the traditional measures, use anything you can possibly find to promote benefits, don't do anything that can possibly reduce the amount of regulations. Now, uh, again, you may say we need these regulations. There's, things are not fair out there. We need to fix this. But I take you back to your principles of economics class. You increase regulations, you shift the cost curves of firms upward, they produce less output, higher fewer people. Hence, I'm anticipating much slower growth as we get into this year and into next year. Uh, now, what? Oh, uh, the one thing here I wanted to circle. The circle didn't show up in the right place. Not surprising. What's going on here? That circle is supposed to be around 22, the fourth quarter. I said the one thing that could cause all this to slow down and maybe not happen so much is the uh, the uh, the midterm elections. Midterm elections. If there are changes in the Senate and the House. Then, uh, then things can uh, end up not being quite as uh, unfortunate as I think they're going to be. They're going to be right now. By the way, I have some wisdom for you about exercise. 
sharing with you lots of different well, I guess in marriage before, having some exercise. If you exercise, you should know the inventor of the treadmill died at 42. <laughs> the inventor of gymnastics died at 57. The world bodybuilding champion died at 41. The best footballer in the world, Maradona, died at 60. However, if you don't exercise, the KFC inventor died at 94. <laughs> the uh, inventor of Nutrella brand died at 88. The cigarette maker Winston died at 102, for God's sake. Can you believe that? And the inventor of opium died at 116 from an earthquake. <laughs> I thought that was great. And then the Hennessy inventor died at age 98. So, you know, eat, drink, rest, chill out, and uh, relax yourself. All right, let's talk, let's get a bit closer to home and talk about the oil prices a bit and what's going on here. First of all, kind of, kind of the good news. If you're in Louisiana, the good news is that look what has happened to, look what has happened to oil prices. It, we, we've kind of gone through this kind of phase right before uh, COVID hit. COVID hits and it goes right straight through the forest. As a matter of fact, you remember there's one month, excuse me, there was one day in which the price was a negative $38. It like, oh had absolutely nothing to do with fundamentals in the economy. It had nothing to do, had, had to do with some contractual peculiarities in the future market. That's all it was. Went away, and then as you can see, the price has come back a lot. As a matter of fact, the price is actually above what it was pre pre COVID, as it turns out. Today, I think in today's paper, it was 88, almost $89, $89 a barrel. And uh, there was actually a Wall Street Journal article a couple of days ago that said the price is going to go. You know, because of what? The cost is going to go to $100 a barrel because of more driving and less drilling. As a matter of fact, Morgan Stanley says $100 by the summer, Bank of America, $117 by July. Now, I'm going to take the position that that's not going to happen. And this is a very, I've <laughs> been forecasting this stuff for uh, 40 years. One of my great fears is somebody in this room is going to go to the state library Get out all the copies of the old Louisiana Economic Outlook and look at my oil price forecast. <laughs> Very scary prospect. Because this is, I taught forecasting to MBAs and executive MBAs for about 30 years, and I told them this is the second most difficult thing in the economy to forecast. It is very, very difficult to forecast oil prices because they are so highly variable, and two thirds of the oil reserves in the world are under the land of countries where the government's running the oil company. And you never know what they're going to do. How many people in this room would have predicted in the latter part of 2014 that saw this one was, we're going to look at the United States and look at all the successful shale production and say, we're going to stop that and just turn on the faucets and just pump all this oil on the market, drive the price down to under $30 a barrel. How many of in this room could have predicted that? It just came out of nowhere, right? Very, very difficult to forecast. I don't think this $100 is going to happen for a couple of reasons. They are right about what is happening to the drilling activity. This is drilling the rig count of the United States. The rig count of the United States before COVID hit was about, was about 800 rigs. It fell down to right at 200 rigs, all the way down to there. It has now come back to where it's around 600 rigs, okay? About 600 rigs. But we're still a good ways away from where we were before COVID hit. It. Now this is important, and the reason it's important that our rig count has not gotten all the way back. Even though the rig count has come back, Production is not going to come all the way back. And the reason for that is this picture right here. This is a picture of the decline curve in a typical shale play, in the bucket play, as it turns out. The, the weird thing about shale, when you drill a shale well, when you drill a shale well, you get most of your production in the first year. By the time you get to your second year, production has dropped in half. I mean, it drops dramatically fast. You drill an offshore, Exxon Mobil or BS, BP or something goes offshore and drills, they're going to hit something, they're going to get a lot of oil out, and the decline curve is going to be very, very slow. That's why you're willing to put $130 million of drilling that sticky wet versus 18, well, $8 million to build to drill this one. Now, what this means is that that's the decline curve. The only way you can get output, oil production, to keep growing is to continually drill more and more wells because you've got to offset the dead gum decline curve in the existing wells, right? And we're not offsetting that, okay? Our, 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 our rig count is still 600 versus 800, right? Now, okay, hang on a second. Uh, 
Now, there, there is one thing that you do have to look out for. Because you can have an increase in production without an increase in root count because of this phenomenon here. This is, these are what's called the ducts, the drilled but uncompleted wells. There are a bunch of wells out there that were drilled. You drilled the hole, but you haven't fracked the hole. And we had about 9,000 of these out there before COVID hit. And what has been happening lately is those companies have been going out there and they've been fracking these wells. So we've been getting, we've been getting, uh, production's been starting to come back, not because we've been, we've been drilling enough new wells, but because we're fracking those old ducts. But the ducts are starting to disappear. Okay? We're, we've already used up about 43% of them. Okay? And as a result of this, I mean, the bottom line for this, what's, what's happening to production in the United States? Production in the United States, you can see peak back here, pre-COVID. Actually, at one point, we're producing about 13 million barrels of oil per day, highest in the world. It can way down. We've come back, but we, we're way away. And there's no indication out there at all that we're going to get back to where we were before. The thing for you to keep in mind is it looks like this year we might add about a half a million barrels of oil per day to production in the United States. I'm going to do some math for you in just a second. I want you to remember that half a million with me for just a second. Now, when you look at demand, this is what, you know, prior to COVID, I mean, demand is going right straight to the ceiling. COVID hits, we have the largest decline in demand for uh, oil uh, globally that we've ever experienced uh, in, in history. Now, it came back last year. <clears throat> this year is expected to go up about 3.4 million barrels of oil per day. We've got two numbers so far, 3.4 million increase in demand, the United States increasing about a half, uh, about a half a million barrels of oil per day. Now we've got to talk about the really important player, and that's OPEC. Why has the price of oil come back so much already? Part of that's because you people are driving more. We, you saw the demand increase. We're, we're, the demand increase is way away from what it was before COVID. There must be something else going on, and it was the supply side and what these people were doing here. What happened was the OPEC plus alliance, which is OPEC plus the Russian people, they got together and they said, we've got to fix this. So what they decided we're going to do is we're going to take 9.7 million barrels of oil off the market back in May and June of, uh, of 2020. Right as things were starting. Now, as it turns out, the Saudis and the UAE and Kuwait said they would cut another 1.2 million barrels of oil. They took a ton of oil off the market. And that's one of the things that got the price of oil starting to come back up again. Now, that price started rising, and so what they did is they decided in December of 2020 to start putting some of that oil back on the market. They put, said, well, let's put 500,000 barrels <clears throat> back on the market. And then they said, by early July, they had been adding more and more. They had added 4.4 million of the 9.7 that was taken off. That left 5.8 million barrels of oil they had still cut, and they want to keep they want to try to get that back. So what they did is they agreed in July of last year, we're going to start adding 400,000 barrels a day each month between now and September of this year. Okay? And they've done a pretty good job of that. In the first half of 2021, okay, once they made the agreement, they were on target. They had added about 2.4 million uh, barrels back, which means they had 3.4 million left. There's a lot of numbers here. Let me put it together for you for the math. Let's talk about the math. The U.S. is adding half a million barrels. OPEC is, OPEC is adding 3.4. Uh, others, Brazil, uh, North, the North Sea, others are at Ghana now, which is a really hot spot, are adding more. Uh, demand is up 3.4. Let's see here. The OPEC increases alone will cover any increase in demand this year. And you got the United States adding oil on, you got the North Sea adding oil, you got Brazil adding oil. It seems to me the prices have got to quit going up. They gotta come down. I just don't I just don't think the math fits hundred dollar barrel oil. It's just it's just it's just too if, if OPEC sticks to their plan, keeps adding four hundred thousand barrels a day, I just don't see how the price will it may hit hundred dollars a barrel a day or so. But I don't think it stay up there. Not with them adding this much oil on the market. Now, so my oil price forecast is this again is why this thing is so difficult to forecast. 
the more variable something is, the harder it is to forecast. I mean, if I showed you food consumption in the United States, I showed you the same graph of food consumption. Let's go straight up. You can take a ruler, uh, a, a pencil, and a piece of graph. Y'all know what graph paper is? <laughs> in a piece of graph paper, you can forecast that sucker 30 years in the future, this plus or minus 2%. You can't do this with this. This is the second most difficult thing in the economy to forecast because of very, those very reasons. Which brings up the obvious question. What's the most difficult thing to forecast? The weather. <laughs> and the climate. We are going to totally change the way we live in this country. We're going to visit poverty on people like you've never seen before. Because we think there are computers out there that can forecast the weather 30 years in the future, plus or minus 2 degrees. I want you to just think about that for just a moment. And say, as I say in Texas, hail. That makes no sense. I even say, hail, that makes no sense. That's how they say that. I know, I'm from Texas. Now, let's talk about the natural gas side just for a minute. I have a couple other things I want to share with you. Natural gas side, <clears throat> this is a picture of the price of natural gas. People in this room are very familiar with the price of natural gas, right? Because this is one of your primary inputs into your production process. And after about five or six years of horrible price increases, this shows you what happens when you have a technological change, a major technological change in an industry. That is all due to shale coming on board. The shale and the associated natural gas that came along with that shale flood. And also, well, of course, it, the, the, the whole thing about fracking started with natural gas, right? Started in the Barnett Shale Play, where the Dallas Airport is, worked over to the Hazel Shale, then up to the, the Fayetteville Shale, which, oddly enough, is nowhere near Fayetteville. But that is Arkansas, <laughs> where people still stop and point at airplanes. But anyway, and then it went to the oil, and they started fracking oil, and you got associated gas. And suddenly, you got so much supply. Look what happened. The price goes down. Now, what has happened here is that I think the price is going to go up, as you can see. I think it's going to be up, what, around four or so over the next two years. It's gone up, and the primary reason it's gone up is because of what has happened to the associated gas. You're not drilling as much in the shale anymore. Remember, only 600 wells versus 800? So you're getting less associated gas. So you're going to have less supply, price is going to go up, and the minute the price goes up too much, just a little bit too much, smart, clever, greedy capitalists are going to go into the dry shell place, like the Hazel Shell. Rick count is already up to 38, where it was 16, in the Hazel Shell. They're going to start going in there, and that'll keep the price from going up very far. That's not the most important graph, I think, for people in this room. The most important graph for people in this room is this one right here. And that's the price of natural gas here, versus the price of natural gas in Europe, and in Asia, we are, our, our line is this green one down here. And the red one is, uh, which one is that? That's the J Japanese, and the uh, blue one is Europe. Now, you'll notice back here, come back here, <clears throat> this area around 19. If you started in about 2013 to 2019, big old gap opened up, okay, between the price of natural gas here and the price of natural gas in, in Asia. Why did that happen? The reason that happens is, well, Japan doesn't have any natural gas, they have to import it. And the Europeans, in the moment of brilliance, decided to outlaw fracking in the EU. they got tons of natural gas under them, but they've outlawed <coughs> fracking, which means they have to rely on importing natural gas uh, from the, the Middle East or from Russia, which Mr. Putin <coughs> right now is loving. We'll get to that in just a second. So this, and, and they price their natural gas. KR and Russia price their natural gas off the price of oil. Price of oil is real high. They take 15% of that value. That's what they charge for natural gas. Well, this big old gap suddenly happened, and suddenly natural chemical companies all over the world started saying, "This is my main input. Where can I go to use this sucker?" And so we've had this amazing industrial boom. <clears throat> in Louisiana and Southeast Texas. As people came here to take advantage of this. Now you'll notice that that gap disappeared during COVID. And well, the reason it disappeared during COVID, everybody got, as a matter of fact, there were a lot of LNG uh, uh, exports that were canceled during that time period. The, the, the Europeans had shut down the industry side. They weren't demanding natural gas. <clears throat> Look what has happened to us now. Oh, hey, this stops in November of 2020. <clears throat> Look what has happened now. 
The price of natural gas in Japan and Europe is around $30 per million BTU. It's $4.50 here. Okay? That's just going straight through the sea. Why did that happen? Because the wind quit blowing in the North Sea. The wind quit blowing in the North Sea. And the Europeans said, we're going to go all the renewables. Okay? And we're going to get our, our, our electricity from the windmills that are blowing in the North Sea. The wind quit blowing in the North Sea. I'll be We'll get more of the North Sea. We gotta have natural gas. We're gonna get natural gas. Well, we can import it to the United States, or we can get it from Mr. Putin. And Mr. Putin says, I've got them. I've got them. <laughs> he says, I've got them. Man. And you need my natural gas, but you're not just gonna pay for the natural gas. That's kind of what's going on right now. This big old gap. That big old gap will partially go away when the wind starts blowing again, but it's still gonna be a big old gap. And that's going to be very good for the people in this room. Because you're going to be using this nice, cheap natural gas. They're going to be using very expensive natural gas. There's no way they can compete with you, I think, in the international market. So that's pretty good news. Pretty good news on the oil price. Pretty good news on the natural gas price. But the bad news is what's going on in, with the Biden administration. And that's starting with this lady being appointed to the uh, Department of Interior head. Deb Halen... Uh, is uh, from Mexico, uh, a uh, uh, representative from Mexico repeatedly called for an all-out fracking ban, <clears throat> support of the Green New Deal, wants a ban on drilling on public lands and water, wants to do away with the internal combustion engine. They did not adequately take into account the planet warming greenhouse emissions issue. The map of the United States of America. <laughs> and I'm a little confused here. Which one of these pipelines exactly is going to be the one that ruins the drinking water? I'm not really. Well, I had a great time here because these are all my friends. I talk to these people on the phone once a year as I'm putting together the Louisiana economic forecast. So my first reaction was, this is great to see pals, uh, men, women, uh, all of them, because they have been a great help to me over the time. We had an awesome meeting. A lot of great information was shared. People learned about leadership and they heard great examples of what leadership means to be in, out in the community and to advocate for our industry. We need strong voices to be able to say that industry is welcome in our community. And so we, I think we heard that today and it was some great message. We would like folks to help us and join industry. If you're interested, uh, look at our website, gabria.org, or go to industrymakes.org. We need everybody's help.